Well, good morning. Thank you very much. Uh, I said yesterday to many of you, I'm not a scientist. I love what you do. I consume what you put out, and I believe it. I've been fighting the Defense Department now for a good 10 years uh, on this whole issue of what are our priorities, and I want to speak to those today. Uh, you gave me a task of 15 minutes, and I'm supposed to talk. It says in here about um, what are the national security implications of achieving global energy dominance. Um, I can't do that in 15 minutes and don't even want to talk about that. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, taking us where the rubber meets the road in the Pentagon and just share with you what goes on and the thing is of the leadership and the guidance it gets and what, how it reacts to that. So I want to start out, well actually when I put my paper together, um, I want to reflect a little bit on the reaction. I, I, I finished it about three or four days ago, felt pretty good about it, because I've been optimistic at, as the direction that the new administration is taking us. And then about uh, 12 hours later, uh, my optimism was hit pretty hard when the White House uh, did not block the forwarding of the National Climate Assessment on into the system that's now being published. And it's got the same old garbage that's been in there for the last eight years. Uh, it's very troublesome uh, that, that, that at least there's a passive indication here that the administration is allowing that to pervade as their point of view. So that caused me to have to kind of rethink what are we going to talk about today, and then I get this tremendous backing on the scientific part yesterday, which is extremely helpful, and I thank you all for that work because I can exploit it. And uh, my, my uh, audience is always a lay group. It's, it's never with this kind of intelligence level, but they're smart people who believe that, that humans are the problem, and they really believe it sincerely, and they're very emotional about it. So anyway, um, uh, I junked my speech, and I'm going to add a little most of it. Uh, as I say, I want to take you into the Pentagon, and I want to take you back, to start with, back into the late 1970s. At that time, I was Commander-in-Chief of the Pacific Fleet, uh, basically responsible for all naval operations in the Pacific and Asia Indian Ocean. Uh, it was uh, during a time when we were coming out of Vietnam, uh, our people and our equipment was worn out. Uh, the attitude in the country was so negative towards those who served in Vietnam that people were bailing out left and right. Uh, recruitment had become a crisis. So how big a crisis was it? Let me explain what we, what we did in those days. This is late 1970, mid to late 1970s. We were so short on qualified, trained personnel that we deployed our carrier battle groups out of San Diego area into the Far East for six or seven months of deployment to be at the top of their readiness and ready to go. We deployed them with three of the fire rooms and three of the engine rooms completely manned appropriately. And one engine room and one fire room had a skeleton crew because we didn't have enough people trained to be able to operate 12 hours a day, or 24 hours a day. We could only meet a combat operation for roughly 12 hours before exhaustion was set in. So the ships are going on the start of the high readiness with one of the screws twirling in the wake. Now what do you think about that? And then fast forward to today. I think probably everybody here has been reading over the last several months of how the U.S. Marine Corps airplanes, about 50% of them are, are grounded. They're not ready to go because of the shortage of spare parts and, and uh, repairs. I can tell you from the Navy's point of view, our F-18, which is basically our, our, uh, uh, our best fighter attack airplane, same situation, half of them are not in the air because they're short parts and training. And, and, and uh, you know, I'm embarrassed to say we have two of our top line destroyers crashing into very big commercial ships. Um, we know now that the better part of that is because we didn't have the people properly trained and it's systemic. And that's what it's all about. The issue to me and to, to the Pentagon, the, the guys in the uniform is basically the issue of readiness. And so that's why I want to just put this one, I, my, my, 
my, uh, my help with PowerPoints was from, from the Heartland, thank goodness, because I don't have a staff. Um, but that's the whole message. That isn't the message. That's not the message, it's backwards. Well, I'll get, I'll, I'll get to those perhaps. The issue really is combat readiness of the forces to go out and, and fulfill the responsibility for which they're charged, which is changing all the time. And because of the turbulence in the world, it's getting more demanding all the time. At the same time that we're putting more and more pressure on our people and our equipment and the kind of uh, situations they might be, have to confront, uh, we are trimming the budget. We've been trimming the budget now, even while at war, for a steady eight years. There is some indication that, that uh, there's gonna be more funds getting to the readiness part of the Navy or all the services with the next budget. I think that's probably true. I think the president would like to put a lot in there. My own view is, from my experiences, there ain't enough money. There are too many problems and that the readiness will come back, but it'll still be at a high strain level for years. So you need to keep that in mind as to what kind of attitude goes on in the Pentagon. Well, how did we get in this shape? We got in this shape largely because of priorities. And one of the key priorities that was competing for readiness all along has been, at least for six to eight years, climate change. Climate change on the budget has a higher priority than readiness of the fleet. How do, how do admirals and generals react to that? You know what, they kind of ignore it. They just do the best they can with what they've got. We all develop strategies that are short term and long term. We take into account the interactions that are going on in Iran, Iraq and the rest of the place. Uh, you know, now North Korea and that sort of thing. We have to bear that in mind and do the best you can with what you've got. The combat zone is, is way out there, but believe me, for those people in Washington, the combat zone is DC. It's a constant budget battle. Everything, all priorities are, are, are solved and worked on on the basis of, of what do we get out of the budget? And the budget has always been turning, and it'll be a big battle to get it to come up very much. So that's what you're going to face. We're all going to face that. And we have to face it in competition with money that's being spent on climate change issues. Uh, we know that over the last six or seven years, the Department of Defense has spent well over $100 billion on just climate change programs. The Navy has not been much better. We spent $58 billion chasing what's called the Great Green Fleet. <laughs> and it's for real. We really had a Great Green Fleet executed about two or three years ago with all the ships in, the, in formation, we, and there were a lot of them, several carriers, destroyers and cruisers out there, all of them on a mixture of 50% biofuel, 50 and then the regular petroleum products, with the expectation by the Secretary of the Navy that he was gonna leave the country in a new direction and, and inspire the, uh, the industry to come up with the kinds of volumes necessary, that, and he proved it. It worked. Uh, but as a logistician, which all military people are, how do you support your people? And up? Just imagine, imagine how many ports around the globe would have the capacity to produce 50% biofuels on a combat basis. You know, it's, it's ridiculous. But we spent $58 billion of spare parts money doing that. So that's the kind of stuff that the, the, um, the military leadership faces. Um, how did we get there? And, and it's, it's, it comes right from, you know, you've heard it from the president over and over again. When the commander in chief says this, the debate's over, it's 97, 98% of all scientists in the world, you guys all believe that it's us humans that are the problem. Uh, that filters down into the leadership of, the, of all the agencies. The president uh, had a policy that all agencies in the country, in the, in the nation, 
our administrative organization, were required to, to create staff that would come up with the solutions in any, in any issue that had some element of climate change taken into it. So huge numbers of people and money were spent just establishing that. And all the services had them, we have them in the Navy, and um, th that's the group that I've been battling for now for years, uh, send them papers and, and, and never get an answer. Uh, and I can guarantee you there's probably not an admiral in the fleet who has any idea what these numbers are you're putting up here because they're, they're dealing with the hard problems of their day-to-day -day operation. And they just have to, that's their guidance, so they do it. As you mentioned yesterday, you know, salute and march off. Unfortunately, it's, it's not quite that arbitrary, but, but that's the direction they have to go. They got much bigger problems than worrying about whether global warming's around or what it's doing, unless it's cutting in the budget. And when it's coming from the commander in chief, and you have to recognize that every service, every, uh, politi every um, civilian in the Department of Defense and the leadership are all politicians. They're all uh, appointments. A few of them had to get approval of the Congress, but basically they're the same party as in, is in the White House. So for the last eight years, we've been having this, it's, it's an edict basically, and, and a real belief in it. I mean, they seriously believe that it's the human element that is the primary cause and that our dear old planet's uh, subject to Subject to disappearing. Now let's see if we can get up there. What, what I'm showing you there, I had a series of these. The CNA is the, is the um, Center for Naval Analysis. The Center for Naval Analysis um, is a group of admirals and generals and a lot of civilians that uh, do all kinds of complex analysis that the services would ask for. And in, in 19... Uh, in 2007, they published a rather lengthy thing, signed off by good friends of mine, and, and they make a statement like that. I highlight threat multiplier. The reason I highlight that, we're going to have trouble with it. Can I go backwards? No. Nope. Well, I'll read it. Um, here's what the, na the, the, the National Climate Assessment says today, just as an example of, of the quality of it. The National Climate Assessment finds that temperatures in the United States have risen dramatically since 1980, with the recent decades being the warmest in the past 1,500 years. Are you supposed to believe that stuff? That's published by the top of the, of the country. Uh, there's another document that comes out every four years, a quadrennial review, published um, two years ago. And it has these words in it. The effects are, quote, threat multipliers that will aggravate, aggravate stressors, uh, such as poverty, uh, environmental degradation, social tension. There are not too many admirals and generals that are going to stay up worrying about that issue when they've got <laughs> readiness problems. But it goes on. There's another document that came down because it came down from the president. The uh, Defense Department created something called the Department of Defense Climate Change Adaptation Roadmap. And I'll read from that. In our defense strategy, we refer to climate change as a threat multiplier because it has the potential to exacerbate many of the challenges we're dealing with today, such as infectious disease. We are already beginning to see some of these impacts. A changing climate will have real impacts on our military the way it executes its mission. Well, the message I'm trying to get there since I've got the, getting a signal at the hook is that God bless you guys and gals. You know, I've, I've listened to you. I use your stuff. It's terrific. Uh, I feel comfortable using it. Um, I mean, seriously, God bless you for what you're doing and uh, Heartland for what it does and, and the motivation it tries to make. We've got an opportunity here to make a real change in, in, at the top of the government in attitude and policy. 
and you guys have got to do it. And uh, us old guys will do the best we can on the side with the, with the lake community out there, the people who read the Seattle Times and all that good stuff. Thank you very much. Thank you.